everyone and uh, welcome to the CFPR lunchtime uh, seminar series. Uh, today we are very honored to have uh, Prof. Chiang uh, Yilin uh, as our speaker. And uh, I was just telling her that I was very taken with the title of the book, very interesting, uh, Study Gods, uh, How the New Chinese Elite Prepare for Global Competition. So really looking forward to hear uh, what you have to share and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, let me just say a few words uh, by way of introduction uh, before we get started. So Prof Chiang is Associate Professor of Sociology at National Chengchi University. Did I pronounce it right? Yes. Yeah. So her research focuses on educational stratification and intergenerational status transmission in Greater China with a special interest in how family background, as well as cultural capital uh, combined to shape uh, children's uh, educational attainment. So that's a very brief introduction. Uh, I've got it off the, 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 the note that we have. So Prof Chang will speak for 40 minutes. Yeah. And then after that, we have Q&A for 20 minutes. Uh, so Prof Chang, uh, over to you. Uh, you can begin by sharing your slides. Thank you. Cool. Um, thank you. Oh, what is my mind? Great. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited to be sharing my new book, um, Study Gods, How the New Chinese Elite Prepare for Global Competition. Before I begin the talk, I will uh, please note that all of the names in this talk have, and in the book have been changed to pseudonyms in all the universities and schools except for my affiliation uh, mentioned in the examples are uh, have been already been changed to sister institutions or institutions that are all similar in, in, in school format. Um, and so please meet Ashley Fong. Um, Ashley Fong is a math major who graduated from Cambridge. She received multiple offers before her graduation and two were particularly interesting. One was that she could move to Switzerland and she would work in the largest corporation in the world. Another was to move to France, Paris specifically, and she would go to the business, the best business school in Europe. Either way, uh, both options put her expected initial salary at about 100,000 uh, euros upon graduation. And so after some decision making, Ashley decided to take the first route and to go work in Switzerland. A year later, even though she was working in Zurich, she felt tired of Zurich being a little town. And then so she got a job at a Japanese investment bank in Singapore. After the job hop, she is currently earning much more than she has been. She is paying a lot less taxes. And as a foreign worker in a Japanese company, she enjoys much better benefits than her Japanese colleagues. At the age of just 24, I asked Ashley what she wanted to do in the future. She wasn't exactly sure as most you know, uh, youth are. She told me I could stay in the same company and move up the ladder, or I could job hop for a higher income, or I could get a master's degree. So when asked where she would consider going, Ashley said an MBA in the US perhaps, like Harvard or Stanford, these places are both possible. Ashley, with all that she believes and all that she thinks, um, is one of the students who come from China, are competitive at school and at work. They are globally oriented and on their way to becoming part of the global elite. In Study Gods, I use a Bordeauxian approach to examine how status reproduction among the elite takes place at a global level. Bordeauxian's class reproduction as a card game. This card game metaphor was originally used to examine marriage strategies among French families, but it is also applicable to understanding elite status reproduction through education in China. So in this metaphor, people, there are, uh, at the card game, there is a table and the players at the table are families or students. The common goal for these players is to win the game, which is to achieve high social status or as high as possible social status that they can. 
they also all have a set of cards at their hand at their disposal. And these cards are the resources that each individual or family has. So everyone at the card table has a different starting point. In, the, in terms of cards, everyone has certain resources, but nobody shares the same resources. Some cards are good, some cards are bad. Some people are born with a winning hand. Others are born with very bad cards. Secondly, to win the game, they need to have a different, they need to have skills and not every player has the same skills. Some know which card should be put down at exactly what moment, while others don't really have a clue and probably would say that they go with intuition. However, these skills make a big difference in whether the player is possible to win the game. And thirdly, but something that a lot of people don't really uh, kind of neglect in this, uh, in this metaphor is that these players need to know how to play, they need to know the game in the sense that they need to be familiar with the rules of the game. Um, at any card game, some people are familiar with the rules, other less so, and there are these still people who don't even know that the ex there exists certain special rules. An example would be a game of hearts there actually is a rule called shoot the moon, which I realized a lot of my friends didn't realize, but they were still playing the game of hearts on their PC or laptop. Using this metaphor to understand elite status reproduction through education, the elites have a winning hand of cards. They are dealt with it as they are born. They have all the resources to win and even more. The elites are also uh, very skilled players. They know how to play. They know how to maximize advantage. They know when and where and with whom to deploy educational strategies to, uh, to uh, instill into their children or, their or themselves educational advantages. And finally, elites know the rules. They know the game. They are not only familiar with the rules, they are oftentimes the people who set up the game in a way that their resources and their skills are given maximum value. Furthermore, they can even change the rules to their advantage when necessary. However, while we know much about the rules of elite status reproduction in individual societies, the rules of the game at global scale is somewhat unclear. Not all educational systems reward uh, certain types of personalities. For example, the US rewards students holistic personalities. Um, they like students who have demonstrate leadership, who are extracurricularly skilled, who are talented, um, and who are basically a somewhat of a well-rounded person. This is not exactly what other countries would like. For example, in China, where uh, students are selected through exams, test scores and academic excellence takes precedence over all other student characteristics. Some countries uh, are like the US, some other countries sometimes are more leaning closer to China. And so with these mixed, mixed bag of countries and their very different student selection methods, what then are the students that govern the game for elite status reproduction at a global level? Using the card game metaphor study gods in this book, I set out to understand who these elite youth are and how they are groomed for global competition. Specifically, I asked how their experiences in Chinese high schools have prepared them for uh, their future. I focus on the roles of schools and families that have shaped their trajectories and to examine how they became who they are through daily interactions. The high schools that I went to, uh, so the data for this book comes from ethnography and is supplemented by interviews with students, parents, and their teachers. For ethnography, I first conducted 15 months of classroom observations in two top high schools in the western side of Beijing. Um, these include domestic departments and international departments. Domestic departments specialize in sending children to universities within China, while international departments specialize in sending these students to America or Britain. Um, in addition to classroom observations, I also did for uh, family observations among these 
students that I knew, I got to stay with four families, uh, three boys and one girl. Uh, specifically for that girl, I was able to stay with her for four days in her house. The other three families, which, were, um, all, which all had one boy, was um, primarily visits during the weekend. Uh, the, uh, the visits averaged about three to four hours uh, in a maximum of seven to eight hours. I also supplement the ethnography with interviews. Um, I conducted interviews with 28 high school students across five high schools also in Western Beijing. Um, I also interviewed their parents and their homeroom teachers or the teacher who they were most, who they were closest with. All of these high schools were in, were ranked in the top 10 in Beijing out of about 291 or almost 300 high schools. And so these students are, basically top performing. Uh, they are very high academic performing. Um, after 2014, when all of the students have graduated high school, I've continued to follow them around the world. Um, between 2014 to 2019, I made follow-up visits to them and I conducted uh, multiple interviews with them whenever we met. Um, a lot of them were in New York, some were close to Philadelphia where I was at at the time. There was, of course, Ashley was in Singapore and there are also others in Europe, um, Japan, um, uh, and of only a few, uh, and in fact, three out of the 28 were still in China at the time. And so uh, elites are differently or variously de uh, defined by different uh, studies. In this study, I take the common approach, which is to use the social economic definition for elites. Mainly, um, all of the families that I study had to have top 10% family income in urban China um, because Urban China is about half the population. It's probably safe to say that all these two, all these families have top five percent family in China as an entire country. Um, the median family income, in fact, for these students was actually twice as high for a top ten percent family of three in urban China. And these estimates are most definitely too low because there's still great income that is unreported. Um, but otherwise, these, all of these students' uh, families had assets in various cities in China, and all of these families mentioned that they could afford sending children to the U.S. for college by self-paying. By self um, using this definition of elites, students shared other characteristics as well. Um, their parents were primarily in professional managerial positions. Over 90% of the students' parents are college educated, which puts them in the top one or 2% in terms of education in China. Um, and two thirds of the families have military or party affiliation and all of these families and their, uh, the children have Beijing hukou. In addition to the children being top performing, their family resources is uh, quite high, let's just say. And so in 2012 and 2013, it was quite easy to follow these students. I would hop on a plane, go to Beijing, do a round of interviews and visits, and I would get all 28 of them um, in the sample. By 2019, it was a little difficult. I had to travel around the world and to, eat, to usually visit one maximum two each, in each international trip. These students have also changed. Um, before they were high school students, you know, those quirky teenagers. But 2019, they were somewhat accomplished young adults who we were working in uh, finances or in academia. Um, they were uh, no longer high school students, but workers in a sense. Um, in 2012, most of them, all of them were in China. In 2019, only three were left there. Instead, they really scattered around the world. And so um, for those who have been working after college graduation in 2017 or 18, all of, all of them had received top five to 15% individual income in the countries that they were working. And this includes the US, the UK, Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, and of course, um, including China. The elite students in top high schools in my study have learned at least three things as they are preparing to go for a global competition. The first thing is that they needed to understand the rules of, this, of the game which is to know the state of system, how the system is set up, what matters, what doesn't, what counts, what does not count. And then they need to strategy, they need to strategically navigate the state of system, which is to skillfully play this game of competition. 
And then finally, third, they always need to plan for contingencies in case anything fails or in case they encounter bumps on the road, they would need a fallback plan to stand up immediately and rejoin the game. In this talk, I will focus on the first one and the second one, which is to know the SATA system and strategically navigate the SATA system through daily interactions. Um, to introduce the SATA system, let me uh, say a little bit about what the student SATA system is. To get top SATAs and become a, a so-called elite inside the high school, one must know what are the value characteristics. The students in the study had a very, very clear hierarchy among themselves, and the system is found across all five high schools that um, I visited. The students constantly evaluated each other and also their high schools according to this. The rule in the high school was simple. Test scores determined everyone's status in school. Those with top test scores are who could go to Baking or Tsinghua University, the Ivy League or Oxford or Cambridge would have high status in school. And those below the school average would have very low state, would have low status. And the below average, meaning if they cannot go to Beijing University or Tsinghua University, or if they went to schools such as UCLA or Wisconsin Madison. Just a disclaimer, I think UCLA and, U and Wisconsin Madison are great. I would be perfectly happy if I went there. But these students clearly have a very different uh, standard than uh, me or most, uh, or most commoners. Um, and so, however, there is a problem with this data system. These schools that I mentioned are top 10% in uh, our top 10 out of 300 in Beijing and the students are top performing. They're really all top 10% too, not just in family background, but also in test scores. And so when as many as a quarter of one's schoolmates are going to end up in top universities, it isn't likely for all of them to have equally high status. But in any hierarchy, it is almost impossible for 20 to 25% of the population to have high status. And so a secondary form of division emerged, which was demonstrated ease or the apparent lack of effort in studying. With these two criteria, um, students who demonstrated ease and top, high, top scores would have the extremely high status. And then students who did not demonstrate ease, but who had top scores would still have high status, but not the absolute top high status. And so in this sense, the hierarchy became a fourfold hierarchy, starting with the study gods. The study gods are students who I just mentioned don't seem to be studying, but they are very high performing or even top performing. Study holics then are also in high status because they are top performing, but they are below the study gods because they study a lot. They are visibly uh, putting a lot of effort into work. And then moving on to the low status categories, we start with the underachievers who don't study and are also low performing. Finally, we have the absolute bottom, which is the losers who study a lot, but are still low performing. So you can see that in this system, test scores determined student status. Basically, high performers had high status, and it is even better if they demonstrate ease in whichever status group that they had. And so in other words, this is quite a one dimensional status system in which test scores is the absolute determinant of one's status or at least the most important determinant um, factor of one's status inside school. Schools, um, status in schools carried real consequences by student to students. They basically shape their everyday interactions with almost everyone around them. An example uh, would be Claire. Claire had top status in school. Students who never talked to her knew her and she, she basically dominated student attention. Claire was a study god who later went to Yale University. But before that, it wasn't so clear to me. And so this is how I got to know the SATA system through Claire. Um, all of the students I knew kind of talked to me about Claire and they all knew about her SAT score. They memorized her full application list. Claire, when Claire didn't hear back from any of the universities um, in early in the spring semester, whenever I demonstrated the slightest degree of pessimism, 
um, toward her outcomes, such as I would wonder out loud if she should have applied for other lower rank universities and not stick at the very top. All of her classmates or people who are not her classmates or simply schoolmates, basically the students, would immediately rise to her defense. They would say that Claire had to wait because all the places she applied for were top ranked and that her backups were other students' dream schools. So in those weeks, whenever I was in the school, I felt as if the whole cohort was holding their breath about Claire's admission outcome. Of course, Claire later went to Yale and to celebrate her achievement, the school posted a life-size poster of her on the front gate and showed her full body picture on the flat screen TV facing the entrance of the main building. Underneath her picture was Yale University written in all caps and bolded. Other students' headshots with admission results then flashed by in no particular order. Students remembered who she was even in the next year after she had graduated. Claire's classmate Brandon, however, was one of the faces that flashed through that flash screen TV. Brandon was a below average student and his SAT score wasn't that high. And so uh, he counted as an underachiever. Um, but Brandon was extracurricularly talented. His American teacher told me that he played violin solo in school concerts. When I shadowed him for an entire week in school, he played basketball uh, frequently with friends and other schoolmates during afternoon breaks. And in my scorekeeping, he was either the highest scoring player or he had the most asset assists. So he was a really good player. Brandon also helped others with homework in his favorite subject, psychology, which was the one subject that he absolutely aced. However, these talents went unrecognized by his peers. No one seemed to remember that he played violin. They didn't care who did what on the basketball court during breaks. There was also no coincidence that it was the American teacher who noticed his extracurricular talent while none of the Chinese, and Chinese national teachers did. Brandon later went to UCLA, which is a top school by, again, our standards, but not for these students. The next year, when I visited the school again to do more ethnography, the students remembered Claire, the study god who had exceptional academic achievements, but they didn't know who Brandon was at all. Um, the status system didn't just determine peer interactions. They were also related to student-teacher interactions. As I wrote in a film no expert of mine, let me read it to you. I went to the school and interviewed Wei Chen on the sunny day. Our interview ended slightly before the class started when the bell rang. As soon as the bell rang, Wei Chen left for his classroom and his biology teacher, Mrs. Tang, walked in around at the same time. As soon as Mrs. Tang entered the teacher's office, she peered at Wei Chen's back and approached me with folded arms. After Wei Chen had left, she said, Wei Chen wanted to hit the gym last Tuesday but it was after hours. So when people see that at a gym or anything is closed, they usually just walk away, right? I nodded. Yeah, I, I didn't know what else you could do if something was closed. Mrs. Tong rolled her eyes, but not Wei Chen. He got angry. He kicked and shattered the glass door of the gym. So, and he was caught on security camera in school uniform. The gym contacted the school. So now we have to deal with it. We told the gym, Oh, he's a 12th grader stressed out about the gao cow, something like that. Fiercely, Mrs. Tang added, I saw him the next day. He wasn't apologetic at all. He even looked proud. Clearly, no one talked to him about this. Wei Chen was a study god who was top performing in school. In this sense, the gym was not part of school property and he had actually committed a uh, crime by vandalizing uh, the gym, by shadow, basically he was, a, you know, he was, that was a crime, criminal act. But then the school took care of it. His parents were never contacted, which then, according to the teacher, had no one talk to him about his behavior. So while Wei Chen had teachers helping him out to the point of taking care of his law-breaking behaviors, Jimmy, who was a loser, had no such experience. In a sense, Jimmy didn't even experience what he should have been entitled to as a student. 
So in this example, Jimmy didn't really do well on the Gaokao. He turned in a college choice list that was filled with universities above his reach. He didn't get into any universities in mainland China and became the only student in his top high school to be without a college placement. In these schools, homeroom teachers knew the details of student performances in their college lists. In fact, some schools even required the students to submit their passwords to their college application system to their homeroom teachers, and then their homeroom teachers will go online to check on every single student's college list. Um, and so this school was also very similar, although not to the point of sharing passwords. However, uh, their, Jim Ming's homeroom teacher was Mr. Hu, who was like most homeroom teachers who cared deeply about his students, and he monitored every single student's college choices very closely. He held meetings with individual students when he sensed that a student was making risky choices, except that he just didn't do this with Jim Ming. So I asked Mr. Hu, almost confronting him actually, um, after the results were out about Jim Ming's outcome and how this could have happened under his watch. In our interview, Mr. Hu flatly blamed Jim Ming's results on the student alone and repeatedly said that Jim Ming, quote, consistently overestimated his exam scores. So in other words, Mr. Hu did nothing to correct Jim Ming's mistakes and simply let him fail. Jimmy later went to a college that was not on his radar. I visited him within two months of his freshman year. Um, his classmates were still happily quite close to each other uh, since high school, but Jimmy by then has lost contact with almost everyone in high school. This was a sharp contrast to the cheerful uh, student that I met during high school. Not just student-teacher interactions and peer interactions, elite status, the elite student status system also shaped their parent-child interactions. So an example of this is Julie. Julie was a study god who was not only top performing, but also the captain of the school's women's basketball team. Her monthly allowances was equivalent to a worker's monthly wage in Beijing at the time. Her mother described their relationship saying that, honestly, I'm quite scared of Julie. So an example of their interaction, which demonstrates why the mother was quite scared of her, is, was took place in 12th grade when Julie fought with her mother about whether she could buy an orange colored cup. In Julie's words, but she told me, the cup looked like hers was completely different from the old and ugly cups at home. And she insisted on having her parents purchase it for her because she had other plans to do uh, with her allowances. The mother, however, thought this cup was a little too expensive and it was unnecessary. Since Julie was leaving co for college in two months, there's really no need, according to the mother, to buy a very expensive whole new cup for her to use for just two months. As the mother explained to me, there are many cups that are brand new and never used at home. Why can't she use, just use one of those? Her father and I would happily use them. The fight between Julie and her mother ended in the middle of the night with Julie tearfully slamming the door in front of her parents and then texting me the next day to talk about this entire incident. However, it wasn't until I interviewed the mother that I learned that Julie actually got the cup she wanted. In fact, the mother had slipped her credit card under Julie's door after the fight had ended. This was a very different uh, type of parent-child interactions with Jiaqi, who was an underachiever. Jiaqi's test scores were never really good in high school and he uh, became solidly underachieving by 12th grade. Uh, at the end of 12th grade, um, seeing that his test scores were still quite low, his smartphone, his parents, his mother basically, confiscated his smartphone, instead gave him a phone that was the same age as he was. So it was actually a silver Nokia, which um, he wouldn't really share or show anyone. And also seeing that Jiaqi wouldn't be able to go to a top university in China and that he wouldn't be able to go to top universities in the US, UK, Hong Kong, or Singapore either, his parents strategized for alternatives immediately. One night, 
just two months, within two months actually of the Gaokao, they told him to sit down on the sofa in the living room and announced to him at that moment that he would be going to a university in France right after the Gaokao. In his mother's words, Jiaxi was shocked. The sturdy boy was in tears and he didn't want to agree with this plan at all. But this was not a negotiation, she said. It was a decision and they had to have uh, already made it for him. So it took Jachi about two weeks to accept that he would be shipped off to France alone, never having learned French after graduation. And then he started learning French. Jachi was later sent to France and he faced expulsion in his first year. Um, he called home frantically, but his mom told him that things were already out of her hands and then she hung up. Jachi managed later to stay in school about two, he said, two hours of tearfully begging his academic advisor to let him stay. Um, and I don't know, maybe his mother did call or did do something in the background, in the backdrop, but Jachi himself perceived receiving no help from his parents whatsoever. And so in this case, while Julie could have her mother's credit card and uh, purchase and make purchases against her mother's will, Jiaqi was not given that entitlement. Jiaqi could not hold on to his dear phone um, and he could not even choose where he wanted to go in the future for college. To get top status and to become elite, one must know what are the value characteristics and what are the uh, behaviors that they could strategically use to maintain their status. So being familiar with the rules that set up the status system in school, students knew what the most valuable criteria to pursue was. In school, they recognized test scores was the ultimate most important thing. And in society, after gra college graduation, they in fact see money as the most important factor that determines status. They interacted with college classmates and work colleagues in similar ways as they did with peers in high school. Namely, if the peer was top performing, they would worship them. If the peer was not top performing, they would probably shun them. Um, test scores simply became work performance. Um, they also believed that their supervisors would favor employees with the best work performances, just as they, their teachers had favored top performing students back in high school. Interactions in, with parents, in fact, did not much, did not change really much either. So when Julie fought with her mom in 2012, um, I visit, uh, I noted that down. I, I later visited Julie in 2019 and voila, who knew she was also still fighting with her mom in 2019. In that incident, she told me it, as she insisted that her mom needed to learn a lesson and to stop annoying me. In the same year when I talked to Jachi, Jachi still felt that he had to accept whatever his parents decided. As he told me in the same year in 2019, his parents might sell their apartments, all of their apartments in Beijing and move to South America. And when I asked what that impacted, how that would impact him, he said, well, that means I would have no home to go back to. But then he felt powerless and that he still had to accept it whatever his parents had decided. So these understandings and behaviors are perhaps best summarized by two parallel quotes from Ming Jia and Alex who did not know each other at all. In 2014, right after the Gaokao, Ming Jia told me in a coffee shop that I quote, test scores are like money. I'm not saying that rich people are respected, but those who have money are a bit more respected than those without. Five years later, Alex, who just graduated from Boston College and started working in a multimedia company, echoed the statement in a noisy tavern in Boston. He sipped his cocktail in front of me and said flatly, people, society, respect those who have money. This is a simple dimension. So these parallel statements show that the elite Chinese students recognize the setup of the SETA system in a capitalist world. They see the status system in school as being parallel to the status system in global society. As they were pursuing test scores in high school, they were familiarizing themselves with the pursuit of money in, in, um, in global society. 
And so just uh, to recap what the study is, uh, has found, who are the new elites who are doing very well and on their way to becoming the new global elite? Well, I find that these students are a bunch of globally oriented uh, teenagers, but now young adults. Um, they are highly successful in school and work. Um, their fields include finance, research, NGO, media, engineering for now, but regardless, they are usually very high performing. Um, they do very well, and even the less successful ones do quite well as well. For example, Jachi, um, who was who was having all that trouble with his parents, with his school, um, is currently an aspiring engineer at Lamborghini, which is middle range income in Italy, but very high prestige in the field of vehicle engineering. And how did they become like this? Well, the less they knew the SATA system and they have strategized behaviors with everyone around them. And finally, they also plan for contingencies. These lessons are learned at least since high school and deployed everywhere they go. Thus, by preparing for college, elite students prepare for global competition. As they become elites in China, they're also trying to become elites in global societies. Given that these young adults might be, um, maybe be an important force of inequality, not only in China, but around the world, this study actually calls for a new refined perspective of the elite. And specifically this refined perspective, uh, perspective could consider the scope of elite status attainment um, by broadening it to not only look at elite status attainment within a country or within a national border, but on the whole as a, a global society. And so the usual definitions of elites is that they are powerful and influential within a country or that they are quite wealthy by local standards. But now in this, in this studies, as I have shown, the new elites are not restricted by borders. They might be born in a country, they have studied in a second, they have already worked in a third, and of course, they might hop around to other places or perhaps retire in a fourth, fifth, or sixth. Elites from different countries will cross paths. Um, they might be uh, they might be in the same school, they might be in the same internships, they probably would work in similar companies. But this all shows that elites in this world are no longer small groups of influential individuals who dominate a country, but an interconnected group that spans across national boundaries. And I believe that understanding elite reproduction at a global level might offer more insight um, than examining elite formation within an individual country. And finally, to conclude, um, elites really are a driving force of inequality. This has been shown not just in the 20, uh, 2007 Lehman Brothers uh, issue and also throughout the COVID pandemic years. There is increased inequality in China, but not just in China, in fact, around the world. Inequality rises rapidly during economic crisis, during the pandemic, and also during war. In such an unequal global society that we all currently are, in um, possessing the skills and abilities that are valued across countries and across educational systems is critical. Um, it will allow us to justify and sustain high status. And receiving training in these skills and abilities becomes a distinctive advantage. Yet because these processes of how one becomes like who they are takes shape through micro interactions at a daily level and also over a long period of time, oftentimes these mechanisms become invisible to the public and therefore are oftentimes unrecognized. But however, again, the study calls that Global society, I believe, would be better off by having a greater awareness of how elite youths reproduce their parents' high status. And then perhaps after that, um, we could all acknowledge that together, every society contributes to producing a group of what is now becoming the new global elites. This is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Chiang. Uh, now we have questions. Uh, anyone? Uh, I see Yasmin. Uh, okay. Uh, Adam? Hello. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, it's very interesting. And I have a question. Um, I, I noticed that you used the word elite. 
uh, and I I think most of the people uh, of of the respondents that you have are having really high income job and then they study really really well and and so so you're talking about the elites that um with a of a professional background things like that and and what I I I want to know more so because um elite or status could be different from wealth right so so. Of course, the elite could be wealthy, but not all wealthy people are, are having this kind of a studying very well in school. So I, I just wonder, because in my maybe my my wrong impression, but some people, they they, they have a lot of money, um, maybe because of the family business of the last generations, and they do not study really, really hard because they don't have to, you know, they they, they just want the family business and that's it. I wonder in, in your sample, do, do you have a lot of these cases or they... Most of them basically just want to study hard and then join this uh, elite group. And I, I ask this because I, I don't know, in Hong Kong, we have quite a lot of people that I know. They, they actually uh, have the money from, from the family and, and they don't really join this group of people. And, and I wonder in your sample, how do um, your, your, your informants uh, actually look at those people? So do they think that they, they're totally, you know, Different different lines of people and 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 I just wondered how this group of people may may be you know integrated in in your findings. Thank you. Okay. Um. Great. Thank you. So I'll just yeah respond immediately. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So this is a really good question. There are at first I was also thinking about the really rich people who don't study a lot a lot at all. There's also some of them, not as many in Hong Kong and Singapore, but some in Taiwan too. Um. And in China, most of these students who don't study but are very rich would go to international schools. Um, if, if, it, it really depends on their test scores. If their test scores are that low, uh, or let's just say if their test scores are high, they would probably go to American focused oriented schools. If their test scores are low, it would they would go to Canadian schools or schools that focus on uh, sending children to Canada. They could also go to pretty good universities just by that. Um, at least we know that Harvard and other places allow students, families to make a sizable donation and will officially admit the student. But then all of these means that they are still trying to get at least a good bachelor's degree. So I don't think, I, I, I can't remember of any cases of, or I've, I don't think I've heard of any family who is rich and students don't do well and they don't care about college at all. They still want the kid to go to a nice college. <laughs> and so I think this is because the elites nowadays need to justify how they arrive at their money. Um, of course, everyone understands the second, third generation riches got their money through family heirlooms, but they still need to justify that they're not a total loser or they're not totally slacking off. And usually this is through education. And so, um, the students in this study, of course, are not those second generation riches. They're only top 10% in urban, in, in urban China. Um, interestingly, all of their parents, however, came to Beijing and got Beijing Kukou, became the Chinese elite through education. And so this is probably one reason why they have this tremendous focus on education, the belief, not just a uh, Chinese culture or Confucianism, but this is how they themselves have received upward mobility. And in my interviews with the parents, they oftentimes tell me that since their child was born, they have decided that just as, this is actually Claire's mother, Claire's mother said that just as we came from Inner Mongolia to Beijing, Claire would go from Beijing to the world. <laughs> and education was one of the most important steps that they uh, plan to achieve this goal. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Yasmin, you want to ask your question? Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. So I'm a migration scholar, and I think what um, really tickled me about your uh, data was this idea of privileged traveling uh, globally. And I wondered if you could say more about that, right? So if if you know knowing the rules of the game depends on the card game you're playing, are you saying that these students are able to transfer their privilege or their knowledge so easily across multiple contexts? Or is it that they have so much economic and social capital and that's what allows them to accumulate or quickly adjust to new card games in the US, in Hong Kong, or in Singapore? So yeah, maybe just say more about that. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. This is a really big question. Um, I, I think I spent two whole chapters on it. But let me, let me, let me um, very quickly, briefly, I'm sorry, this will not be enough, but I'll try my best. Um, first of all, 
I think the most important thing is that they understand they need to know the rules of the game. That is the first step. They cannot just, so a lot of the students in 12th grade or after they receive, especially the students going to the US after they receive their application or uh, admittance, they told me that they were kind of worried. When I, when I, I immediately thought, oh, you mean English, right? Or can you make friends? And they're like, no. They're, they don't care, they, they're totally confident with English, but they're most interested and worried about whether they will know what is important. How am I going to get that A in classrooms? And so this is not just English. They need to, they know that they are expected to speak up in class. They're expected to do a lot more things and to carry out independent research. Um, should they be an RA? Should they volunteer to do work for, student, for professors? All of that is in their mind. And so I think the first most important thing that they got that privilege uh, can, that allows privilege to travel is that they understand this is important. They have to get it. Um, of course, and then a second answer to that question is that no, they don't really do very well. <laughs> in the future. Um, because as much as they try, it's not their native skills. And so they can do however best that they can. They are still top students in the American university system, but it is not as easy as they can sh as they show to be. And so in that sense, um, the ease factor is a little uh, less prominent right there. And um, a third part of that question, the answer is that I'm actually quite pessimistic about their future, because no matter what, this is an age of racism and anti-Asian hate um, all in the states going on. If they're still there, um, studies have shown that Asian Americans or Asian immigrants are doing well in the first few phases and when they're young at the newly occupational stage, but the ceiling comes at the mid-career age. And so I'm not sure what will happen later, but at least they're doing very well right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I ask a question? Uh, you, you know, you talked about the study gods and the, the fact that they are able to demonstrate ease, you know, so um, doing well despite not working too hard. Um, but a, a lot of this is, is a game. So they will, they will say they don't study hard, but actually they are. I mean, they, they, yeah, it's, it's about presentation. It's about, you know, it's all part of this sort of cultural capital thing. Mm -hmm. So, so were you able to ascertain from the interviews whether in fact people were telling the truth, you know, when, when they said, in fact, they were not studying hard, were they really not studying hard or were they, were they just saying they were not? I love this question because Jachi is a prime example who is basically lying. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, he's not lying. He's just trying to put, present himself in a way uh, that, it, that, takes a lot of, that, that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, so an example, it did, these didn't really come through the interviews because in interviews, everyone is trying to present themselves in the best way possible. But through observations and when I was following people around, um, I realized that uh, the most, the simplest case actually comes from the underachievers. They don't do well. They actually study very, very hard, but they try not to let other people know. So the example of Jachi was that whenever I see Jachi in school during night studies or self-study periods, he would be reading car magazines. He would be watching anime. He would just not be studying. So that is exactly what was going on at school. But when I visit him at home um, throughout the week in multiple like random weekends uh, and showing up like not really much announced, he would always be glued to his desk. So in that case, his classmates were actually putting on their uniforms and going to school to study altogether. Jachi was not part of them. Instead, he was studying at home. And so throughout the five, there was once throughout five uh, hours, he only got up from his desk two times. The first time was to go to the bathroom. The second time was to uh, refill his water bottle um, at the kitchen. Both took less than 35 seconds. I asked the mother if this was common. She said, yes, that was exactly what he did every single weekend. And in addition, after I got close to Jachi, um, whenever there were no people around, he would take me to, he would ask me to follow him or go with him to a vacant classroom. Um, and then he would sit there and ask me to teach him English vocabulary or explain to him why this question was wrong or something else. And so, as you said, this is really a performance. 
this is definitely a performance. Um, when I shadowed um, another high achiever who was uh, top 16 out of all students in Beijing, she was a study god. Um, she was also studying at home. She was definitely staying at her desk all the time, glued there um, without, without a movement. But in school, she was considered a study god because she had the leisure to take out, to take a nap right after, right after uh, lunch, which she actually said the lunch, the nap after the lunch was crucial to maintain her focus. But then other students treated this as demonstrating ease. So the performance was definitely a very important factor, and hence that's why I think it's also part of the skill set that they need to learn. Yeah, I, I think so. A, a lot of uh, social construction of reality going on here, uh, and and the presentation of the self uh, mm -hmm. seems oh, to yeah. me in itself a game. You know, yeah. Yes, we yes. have two. Uh, we have two uh, hands raised here. So Zachary, uh, would you like to pose your question? Oh yes, uh, thanks, and and thanks so much for uh, this great talk and this uh, wonderful book. Um, I'm I'm curious if you could maybe say a bit more about uh, gender, and um, I, I know that in uh, in China as well as in more than seventy countries around the world, all over the place, women are outperforming men in uh, education, and um, they're enrolling in college at higher rates and graduate school, and so. I'm curious, um, you know, how you saw sort of gender uh, combining with the status hierarchy and uh, whether or not um, uh, women, for example, were enrolling in the international department more, uh, trying to go abroad. Uh, that's a trend that's happening in, in, in some places. And so um, uh, I would just invite you to share, share some of your insights about um, how gender and the status hierarchy combine in, in this situation. I know that Elite universities uh, in in China and elsewhere still tilt often more um, male, uh, and 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 yet uh, many of your um, top study god respondents are women. So, uh, and and were they accepted uh, by the men readily as study gods, or did they have to perform, uh, you know, being lucky or 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 uh, being less at ease than some of the men, um, that kind of thing. So I'm I'm just curious what you could sort of share with us about that. And thanks so much again for the great book. Thanks. Um, there was definitely a gender difference. Um, as you said, that girls were outperforming boys. So there were more girls in, who belonged to study gods and study, uh, study holics. And there were more guys, like an army of guys in underachiever category. Um, and so that is interesting itself because uh, sometimes you would see girls being very hardworking in classrooms. So that kind of a, the, adds on to the gender stereotypes that girls are obedient. They stick to their desk. They're not very active, but that's primarily um, because I, I I can't say that there's a causal relationship, but there is uh, more girls in the study holic area. And then the with so many boys being like actively trying to become or demonstrating themselves as underachievers, we also get the reinforced gender stereotype that boys are you know out there. They're aloof. They don't care as much. They like they're more active. And so that is it's that that is one thing that happens in the schools. Um, but then actually the interesting part added on is that after education selection, these girls are going to top universities around the world. And top universities entails greater competition. While the boys don't get that much competition because they're going to pretty good universities where they ace everything. And so they have, so when I visited them in, um, in, in college, a lot of the girls were suffering from um, physical illness due to anxiety, or like Claire said, as when I visited her at Yale, she sort of de developed an inferiority complex because everybody was so high achieving and she just couldn't keep up. So this was very common among the girls. Almost, I would say almost eight out of, about 80% of the girls who went to the US had some sort of physical issue in the first semester due to anxiety. Um, the boys, however, were quite confident. <laughs> They were very confident. They didn't go to as top high, as top universities, but they also didn't have as much competition, and they were acing everything. And so that was a very that, that was kind of a difference that I'm not entirely sure how to point my pinpoint, but that is something that emerged. Thank you for asking. Thank you, uh, Mutsun. You want to pose your question? Uh, yes. 
Uh, hi, hi, Prof. Uh, Chang. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. So uh, I actually uh, have a question about this uh, internal streaming or decision uh, making process of, among the study goals. And so as you mentioned that, uh, so basically the high status is indicative of the, uh, first of all, the universities uh, they applied to or they attended, right? And so there has been some internal diversity and some of them is about the top two universities in China but uh, of course, there are like more globalized uh, choices, right? The Ivy League and uh, Oxford, uh, Cambridge, and so on. So I'm uh, wondering, um, like, so basically, uh, first of all, like, uh, how do they um, like make decisions about like uh, which stream to go? Because uh, the preparations required are very different for these two streams, and that may need to uh, happen like. Uh, or at an earlier age, right? Like early stage, like uh, during a senior high school. And secondly, uh, actually that um, might, uh, that decision might translate uh, differently, right? Regarding this value um, either as a global elites or as just like more marketable values uh, inside China, right? Because uh, if you're talking about globalism, uh, we talk about a uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, probably those uh, international top schools are uh, like a, a preferable, right? Like a, a better position to like uh, fulfill those roles. Um, and uh, I guess that's also uh, relates to my third question, like uh, how uh, do the relationships um, like between those uh, like elite family uh, study god and their uh, high achieving uh, peers from humble origins, right? So for example, those who like uh, are doing academically equally good, um, but uh, uh, from like a middle class or working class or even uh, lower social class, right? And so basically, um, like relating back to the streaming process, right? And so sometimes uh, if you're talking about the top two, it's probably just based on a standardized uh, entrance exam. And so it can be like an equalizing mechanism. But uh, if you're talking about the applications to uh, Ivy League international top schools, and that definitely requires much like family resources. And so, I mean, um, so basically, uh, uh, it can be put that uh, how do those uh, elite family study gods like make sense of their elite status uh, in reference to their uh, like uh, equally academically capable uh, peers from humble origins and how does that uh, speak to their like a streaming process? Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so the first question was how they decided to go abroad. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually decided before they mm -hmm. go to high school it's in the first thing that they need to do is to choose whether you want to pay for international department mm -hmm. or a domestic department the domestic department is 750 yuan um, for tuition while the international department is right. uh, 10,000 yuan so <laughs> it's a lot more mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, of course with that amount of money the difference becomes a parental decision after all they were only 15 or 14, mm -hmm. 15, 16, 14, 15 mm -hmm. when they entered the school. So oftentimes this is a family decision and the parents usually would make a very elaborate, de deliberate choice of whether their children will go abroad in, in uh, college or actually the mm -hmm. alternative was after college. And so for them, um, I think there are a lot of mixed concerns. Um, the, some parents wanted children to go abroad as soon as possible. Other wanted their only child to stay with them for four more years. Um, so that they could help out with whatever they needed to do or something like that. And so that was not really a student decision, but mm -hmm. the families had multiple considerations. Um, and then the effect, of course, as you said, is very different. It's better to go earlier than later, but actually I would say that the best would probably to go in high school when they are, can already learn exactly how to uh, uh, like, fit in American society. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they will probably never really fit in because they were born and raised in China for most of their lives. Um, so this is this is like an immigration, I think this is an immigration, a very interesting immigration question that we could look at. How does assimilation occur? Mm -hmm. Is it still segmented when people are really trying to join the mainstream elite? And how do they break out from um, other cultural norms that are not exactly uh, at the come at e as easily. Um, 
Um, your third question was about relationship between two different types of origins, but right. equally, yes, that was actually the origin original plan for this entire thing, for this entire study. Mm -hmm. But then I later realized that um, I had to abandon that project because I couldn't find anyone from humble origins in these elite schools. These elite schools are tested in, they don't select based on family background, mm -hmm. but the fact that I could not find working class background students what came as a shock and it kind of attests to some of the research that have shown that um, family background selection mm. takes place in, in the first education selection, which is this one. I do have a little uh, um, information about how people inside Beijing or Tsinghua universities, like they are all top performing. They're in the same university. Some, and some are from elite backgrounds and a lot are from humble backgrounds. Um, during in that time, um, I think students at first were still focusing on test score competition. And so, when, and unfortunately, the elite study gods found out that they were no longer study gods in, uh, in Beijing University or Tsinghua University campus because they were outcompeted by students from rural places, which they call so called rural kids are crazy because they study all the time. Right. But then the problem then was that as elites, they shifted the rules of the game they decided that ease was more important than test scores, essentially shifting the underachievers versus the, stu stu uh, the study holics. And so the humble kid, the, or kids with humble origin who study very hard and have very high test scores, all of a sudden had low status. But then they were able, the, the elites themselves were then able to put on that front, that performance, and then they had top status mm -hmm. again. Um, of course, all of this changed immediately after they graduated, where work performance became the main thing again. And so this kind of demonstrates the, the power of the elites. They, could, they really could change the, the whole SATA systems. And kids of humble origins, despite all their effort and despite their performances, had no way to confront them, but instead were simply passively sorted into a different right. status group. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I know we've reached the top of the hour, but uh, could I just uh, uh, have one more question? Yeah, Is it yeah. okay? Yeah. Because uh, Wagwan has, uh, Wa has raised her. Uh, Can I also show my PowerPoint so, slides yeah. for a 30% discount? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Wagwan, you, do you want to post your question? Sure. Hi. Uh, Jiang Laoshi, thank you very much for this uh, rich talk. Uh, I studied drama and theater, so I know nothing about education and ethnography, so please don't laugh at how childish my question is going to sound. Um, the title of your talk is Study Gods, and I'm wondering to what extent uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned that the end result for these study gods is to get rich, right? It seems to be common financial power, pushing power is the ultimate goal. How many of them, if you call them study gods, actually aim to become uh, the gods of education, you know, aim to become, to get a PhD, to train the next generation, to become public intellectuals, or to become gods in their own country, to become part of the political elite. Uh, you mentioned too in, your, in, your, in the beginning of the talk that um, the network that they form globally is an important part of, of, of this, this process of becoming. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about, about that process, about them continuing that kind of global uh, connection after they graduated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a very difficult question, uh, uh, but the global connection is pretty interesting. So um, the students, I, I primarily asked about their networks when they were in college in various places by doing that. Um, they, I asked who their friends were, where they were from, how did they know each other, and where their best friends came from. All of these questions pointed out that these students um, tried very hard to make connections with students around the world. Um, for example, Alex, who was in Boston College, um, he deliberately befriended a group of Kenyan students. I'm not sure why Kenyan, but um, he had that, that was an important social group for him. Ashley, who went to Cambridge, deliberately tried to fit in with all the other local students. Um, she was trying to establish friendships. She even formed multiple relationships with them, uh, personal and friendship wise. Um, she very much imagined and tried to become like part of them. Um, 
Um, there is also, for example, Claire, who uh, started dating a Singaporean and very quickly tried to immerse herself into the Singaporean community right there. And so I think these are important networks that they're doing. Um, of course, there are some who simply stay within the local community, the, the, the Chinese network community, because there's a lot of Chinese students anyway. They have a huge Chinese student association that they could simply draw networks and resources from. But the fact that these students are trying very hard to immerse themselves into other national groups, um, I think is part of their attempt to make that global connection. Of course, this is very, uh, this is kind of like a, like a somewhat, somewhat of a slim evidence because this was uh, not exactly what I was focusing on. And I couldn't get too much information out of them after in college because I could only visit them instead of stay with them. So it was not that much of an ethnography anymore. But I do think that this shows that they have attempts, they have the desire, and um, we'll see how it goes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Chiang, for taking the time to share your uh, very interesting research with us and also for sharing the this is the discount code, right? So the yes. P321. P321. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so uh, everyone, please take note of this uh, of this uh, uh, discount code. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, shall we show our appreciation to Prof. Chiang? Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wish everyone a very good weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you.